is about to start. We'll talk about code or whatever we'll talk about today. It's about to start, so please hang tight while I check that everything is okay. Sound check, camera check, lights check. How's my hair? Oh, wait, I don't have any hair. Maybe put some pants on and I am good to go. So get ready wherever you are. Cause this stream is about to start. Get ready wherever you are. Cause this stream is about to start. Hi, my name is Lenny Facchinetti and let's write some code together, shall we? It has been a while since I said this. It feels good to finally say this again. So what we have on the menu today is two things. We will be writing some code. We will be coming back to the data bender and we'll make it work with longer files by splicing parts of the file together and bending them in combination. It's going to be a lot of fun. But before we get to that, I do want to talk about something that has nothing to do with programming, but I think it's worth talking about anyway, because it is something that I think most people will already know, but it is worth reiterating because it's something that you need to know. So sometimes it's worth repeating it. And the reason why I haven't streamed this month and I am in a different place and everything has to do with this thing that I am learning and my YouTube channel is all about sharing what I am learning. So I thought it would make sense to share this with you, even though it has nothing to do with programming or music production. So the truth of the matter is that I am coming out of an abusive relationship in the sense that it was emotionally abusive. And I want to share a couple of things that I am learning in the process of getting out of this relationship. And Again, nothing new, nothing that you probably haven't heard before, but it is worth saying because it is worth remembering these things. And if we don't keep saying things, sometimes we forget them. So the first thing that I, I want to share is that you may get into an abusive relationship even if you know the signs. And that is a bummer because humans are biased and even if they know that they're biased, they're still biased. It's just crazy how we work. So I knew all the signs. I knew that, yeah, I, I usually don't write notes, but this time I wrote notes. Uh, I, I don't want to say things that I think don't represent what I'm really thinking. One of the signs, the abuser is never wrong. That's a telltale sign that it is an abusive relationship. Sometimes we are wrong. And it is the healthy thing to admit that we are wrong and apologize. But an abuser, uh, an abuser will never do that and will always make you think that you are in the wrong and that you should apologize. Telltale sign. I knew about it and I couldn't see it until I really couldn't take it anymore and started leaving the relationship. Gaslighting. The person is going to make you think that you have done things or you have been places that you have never been to. And they will keep repeating that until you start second guessing yourself. Am I really this person that the, pers the other person is describing? No, probably you are not. But still, even knowing that, it may happen to you. And to make that effect even stronger, the abuser will cut you out of your support network, your friends and um, family and that sort of thing and that will make it even more believable the things that they say doesn't matter if you know these things you may still be in an abusive relationship you gotta watch out and when other people around you say that things are wrong believe them <laughs> don't believe yourself don't trust yourself believe other people who can see from an educated distance the things for what they are because they are probably right and in the middle of the relationship, you are probably wrong. You can probably not see everything that's going on. 
Second thing that I learned, it is a realization that is really difficult for me. You know the idea of don't feed the trolls? I, am, I very much believe in that. In fact, on the internet, I think I'm pretty good at, don't, at not feeding the trolls. I do not participate in places where trolls typically exist. So I don't have a Twitter account. Well, I do have a Twitter account. I don't use my Twitter account. <laughs> I had to create one to get support for a thing. You know how some companies don't have a, user, a customer service system? They use Twitter instead. So I do have a Twitter account for that, but I don't use Twitter. And overall on the internet, I don't use lots of social networks. There is my YouTube channel, but other than that, I don't have social networks. So I try to distance myself from the trolls and I'm pretty successful at that on the internet, even though I am a very online person. I have a YouTube channel. I stream almost every day when I can. <laughs> so on the internet, I'm good about not feeding the trolls, but in real life, I may not be as good I still try to de-escalate conflict and walk away from situations, but in an abusive relationship, it is much, much harder to do that. You may not even realize that you are feeding the trolls. And the other thing I used to feel, and I knew was wrong, was the concept of how come the trolls get to say whatever they want, and I have to just take it so that I don't feed the trolls and don't respond back. How do I just have to take it? And this is what I found, but I knew that the answer was, I shouldn't take it. I should not allow the person to have that effect on me. And, and, and then I started to really not only cognitively know it, but also emotionally know it that yeah, you can just realize how silly that situation is when the other person is being a troll to you. You can just realize how silly all of that is. Perhaps even realize where they're coming from, because if they are a troll, probably they have had some kind of situation that led them there. I'm trying to restore my faith in humanity after this dark period. And I do believe that generally people are good, so if they're not being good, it means that something has happened to them. So you can even try to extend some compassion to the trolls to some extent. Because in the end of the day, I think that the best you can do for yourself is to distance yourself from, from the trolls as much as possible. And that's what I do online. And that's what I, I know. But now I'm starting to also feel it. And I thought it would be interesting to share the stuff that I'm learning about this. And the third and final thing that I have to, to say on this topic before we get to code, which we will get to, <laughs> the third and final thing is, has re it is related to not feeding the trolls, but it is to just abandon the idea of getting closure or getting some kind of understanding from the abuser. It is really difficult because you are looking for respect for closure you're looking for um i guess validation and in the process of wanting that you are feeding them you you're giving them more and mo more power over you the unfortunate reality is that the trolls or the abuser they don't have that to give it to you they don't have the closure that you would want they just don't have that in them, so they cannot give it, give that to you. And it does not matter if you do everything right. If you try to show compassion to them, if you try to understand where they're coming from and the abuse that they have been through so that now they're abusive to you. It doesn't matter if you do everything right. And I'm putting this in quotes because I'm well aware that in an abusive relationship, the abused person also plays a role and also bears some responsibility. So you cannot just say, I was in an abusive relationship, point the fingers at the abuser and blame them for everything. That is not the way to go. And I completely take the responsibility that I have for being, for having been part of this abusive relationship. But anyway, it's just that the closure that you want is not something that the abuser can give you. So just let that go. You, it is difficult because you sort of 
you feel like you deserve that, and maybe you do, but you will not get it. Luckily, it is something that you want. It's not something that you need. That's what I'm realizing for myself anyway. I don't need closure, approval, validation from the abuser. I will never get it, so I guess thinking this way is a compromise, but it is also healthy, it is also the way to go. So instead of focusing on the things that I want, I can focus on the things that I actually need. And those are sleeping well, eating well, exercising, doing the things I like, for instance, streaming and talking to you. So that is what is really important. And that will get you connection and acceptance and validation and all the things that you want. But first you have to focus on what you really need. And again, taking responsibility for my part of the problem, I was not taking care of these basic things during the abusive relationship. And that's, that's all I want to say on this topic. <laughs> so now let's move on to code. Not was one and Bo are here. Hello. Thanks for coming to my TED talk about, <laughs> about abusive relationships. <laughs> this is what you get, right? And I appreciate your business because I know that I'm not the only person in the Reaper community streaming right now. I think I, schedule, I scheduled my stream before John did. But anyway, I was watching John's stream before I started my own. So I, I appreciate that you are here with me today. So, all right, with the mushy feelings out of the way, let's get to data bending. The thing that I want to do today is what is on the title of the stream. Up to this point, we have played with relatively short files. The video that we are using it as, a, as an example doesn't even have 10 seconds of video. So it's a short file. And we applied all sorts of crazy audio effects to the video. We played with the pixel formats, the sample formats, all that good stuff. So at this point, what I want to do is take a look at a longer video. This one is 25 seconds, for instance. And the plan is that I'm going to splice parts of the video. So I'm going to do some cuts. And naturally, as with everything else in this project, the cuts are going to be somewhat random. And then I'm going to use some FFmpeg effects that combine two video streams. So I will be overlaying, I will be multiplying, I will be... You get the idea. I will be applying effects that combine two video streams on top of one another. When we were first experimenting with data bending by hand with Aria, and I think it was on his channel, IDDQD sound if you don't know Aria. Anyway, when we were playing with data bending by hand on uh, those streams, the combination of the of multiple videos tended to have super nice results. So let's get to it. The first thing is we have to know how to cut a video using FFmpeg. Of course, because we want the whole thing to be automated. We want to just throw a video at the tool and the data bender is going to do whatever it needs to do. <laughs> Heavy self-reflection there, Leandro. <laughs> yeah. Yes, that is very much the case. So I looked at two places. First, FFmpeg help gives you the highlights, the most important command line flags. Because as you know, FFmpeg is a giant project with thousands of features and therefore thousands of command line flags. These are the most important ones. I like coming here as the first place to see if something in here helps me, especially when I'm not dealing with a particular parameter of a codec, for instance. When that's the case, it's usually better to just go to the documentation for FFmpeg Online. But over here we have some per file main options, and that's exactly what we're looking for. We want to first seek into some place in the file. So let's say that we have a file that is 25 seconds long. 
and the 25 seconds is really just a convenience for putting this file in version control and helping you run examples really quickly when you download the tool. But now that we are going to handle bigger files, you don't have to cut things before time, before using the data bender. You can throw five hours of video into the data bender because it is going to just find a place in the middle and start, in com start combining things. So perhaps it would be even better if you had long footage because you will have more variation. Anyhow, we are going to seek, and that is equivalent to just putting your playhead somewhere. And then we are going to set a, dura a duration. So let's say that if you give me a video that is longer than 10, than 10 seconds, then this long video mode is going to kick in and it is going to, to chop some slices that have 10 seconds, that are 10 seconds long, and try to combine them. So let's see if this works by just trying it. And the other thing I did is I Googled, as you can see, and they, the, the Google results tend to agree with what we saw here. Yeah, so let's try and build this command. We will want to use ffmpeg. The input file will be Why is it long small? I forget. Oh well. That's the name. And the output will be in raw. If you are new to this project and you have no idea what data banning is about, it is about taking a video and processing it as if it was audio. And to do that, we have to strip away all the headers, all the metadata, all the container information from the file. An MP4 is a self-contained file that contains not only the video, but also what is the frame rate? What is the bit rate? What is the boundary from one frame to the next? All of that is encoded in the file. And in this raw data format, we have just pixel data, just colors. So we don't risk corrupting the file as we data bandage. Anyhow, let's look at the command line flags that we use. Actually, let's run this just once so I can get from the logs one of the commands that we run. Yeah, and since I ran the tool, I might as well just show you an, uh, an example of a data band. So this is a video that is not data band. And then when you data band, you get stuff like this. <laughs> and I guess this one is a bit uninteresting. This one is nicer. That's the kind of tool that we are doing, the kind of thing that makes me happy. Why is this all white? This is bad. This is more interesting. All right. Let's open the log. And in particular, I am interested in the first command that we run. So I will want to have this Y command line flag. What it does is this allow ffmpeg to ask whether I want to overwrite files. It is going to overwrite files forcefully. I usually don't have a laptop. This is new for me. And apparently there is this force touch feature on the touchpad, so if I, I, I click only a little bit harder than usual, it activates this dictionary thing you just saw. That's weird. Anyway, the input file, that's that. Then these are the parameters to create a raw file. And he thinks that this is PowerShell, it's not. Let's change this to plain text again. And I'm not going to explain all of this again, but you can sort of see what's going on. This is the format, this is the size, 
sample rate pixel format and turn off the audio. That's all there is to it. More details on previous streams. So if I just do this, it is going to convert the whole file. But if we seek and we are going to seek 10 seconds into the file. So I think that the way I represent that is by saying 00, zero hours, 00, zero minutes, 10 seconds, and 00, zero frames. I think that that's the syntax, judging by what I read online, because unfortunately it does not give me an example of a time of set here on this help. And that's understandable, because it is a short help text. And then the duration. Again, I think that I need to represent this like this. So perhaps I'm not going to seek exactly to second 10, to, to, uh, sorry, to 10 seconds. I'm going to seek into seven seconds just so that these two arguments are different. So what I expect to see is a raw file <coughs> that starts at seven seconds goes until second 17 and that is going to be a raw file so perhaps what I will do to test is not output raw I would just output something like an mp4 and this will be like a section of the video or cut of the video It didn't fail, which is good news. And we do have a file here, and the file is 10 seconds long. Now the only question remaining is, did it start at, sev uh, at 7 seconds into the video? And it appears that it did, because this is different, right? It's not the first frame, but let's seek into second 7. And there you have it. And is this still a valid file? Is it still playable? It seems to be. Excellent. That's what we need from FFmpeg. Well, that's part one. <laughs> that's part one of what we need from FFmpeg. And just to double check everything, I will run this and we will get a raw file. So it will be a bit more difficult to see what's going on because we cannot simply play it. Well, I guess I can play it if I call FF play. Yeah, FF play takes arguments that are different. I'm not going to bother actually playing the file, but my reason to want to do this was just to double check that nothing would blow up nothing blew up perfect let's continue and i will put this command in our sheet sheet mm, about here so this is cut long video we will be using this as a reference when we go to the implementation now the next thing i want to do is to have two cuts and i want to experiment with the commands that combine two files with a filter graph and everything it's gonna be crazy Mage is here. Hey, what's up? And John is here. High five. Great to see you all here. Thanks for joining. Let's do two cuts. The first will be just like this, and I will call this the cut number one. And the second will be cut number two. And we will have a different pixel format. 
what else could I change? Well, definitely another point into the video. So let's go to second 13. And the duration I will keep. And the video is 25 seconds long, so that should be fine. It's, gonna, it's not going to run out of video. So the only, I think that the only thing I can play with is the pixel format. Let's do RGB 24. Okay. Okay, we have the two raw files. Now we need to find the way to combine two files. And again, this is something that we have done in the past, but I forget. So how about we come here to stuff.js, that's what I'm looking for. Because when I was looking at all the filters, there were some filters like these filters that were combining different audio streams. Remember, the whole point of data banding is that we are going to be applying audio effects to video files. So these are the audio filters that have two audio inputs, crossfade, multiply, whatever the hell this is, X correlate, sidechain compress. Oh, that's amazing. We are going to be sidechain compressing one of the videos with the other. It's going to be crazy. Amazing. So the thing, I already know the audio filters that we can use. There are not that many. The thing that I do not know is how to use these filters. So let's go to the FFmpeg documentation for like sidechain compress. And when you first come here, you will see that there are many manual pages. The one that we are interested in is this one for filters. And this documentation is long, but it is great because it comes with examples and examples are great. Let's paste this example into a new buffer and we will have two input files. That's, that's correct. And not only we will have two input files, but we need to say how this file is going to be interpreted because it is a raw file. So we need to say what is essentially this stuff. In a nutshell, that's what we need to say. So we will need to say what is the format Again, it is a raw file. We need to inform FFmpeg what the format is. Sample rate, number of channels. We need to inform all of these because the file doesn't have this kind of metadata. Then we can provide the file name. Like so. And now, again, it thinks that this is PowerShell. It's not. And to keep things simple for the time being, I am going to pass the same arguments to the second. To the second input, like so. But we will have even more interesting results if we start messing with these formats and sample rates and whatnot. Because I think that if we mix and match, what FFmpeg will do is convert the sample rate from one of the two into the other so that they are compatible and that FFmpeg can actually process the audio. And when it starts doing that, that resampling, I think will be interesting. I think it will give you crazy results as always. And I guess I should explain something that at this point, it's sort of implicit, but I should explain this. When using FFmpeg, you pass these thousands of command line flags but the order of them is significant. So when I am putting all of these parameters here, they apply to the next input file that I specify. And that's why I have to specify the same parameters again. You can see that this part repeats because I am using the same parameters for the second input file. So it is always option, 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 input file. Option, 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 input file. Option, 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 output file. 
And when we are dealing with a single filter, we can just tell what the filter is. We can just say dash filter and then the name of the filter, like high shelf equalizer or something. But because we have multiple inputs, we have to use this more complex form called filter complex. And it is complex because it, it is actually a graph of input sources, filters, and how they're going to combine, and then multiple outputs, maybe. It's crazy stuff. Not so sure about multiple outputs. Don't quote me on that. Anyhow, what the hell is going on in this filter complex situation? This is sort of a domain specific language in and of itself. It is a language that allows you to specify the filters and how they relate to the inputs and whatnot. It is crazy stuff. And I am not sure I understand most of this. But it was given as an example, so hopefully it is going to work. We'll see. And then I need to provide an output name. So I guess I will just call this output. Oh, and I think it is important that I provide these options again. I don't remember. Yes, so this is an example of an audio filter that has a single input, so it's much simpler. I just give the name of the filter, and then I do have to specify all of that again for the output this time. So copy and paste. Yeah, this is messy. I'm going to format this real quick. It's not something that I often do, but this is so long and complicated that I think it will be worth it. So these are global parameters. The back slash means ignore the new line right next to it. So these two are equivalent. And this allows me to format the command line a little better. So this is stuff for one input. This is stuff for the other input. This is stuff for the filter itself. And then finally, some stuff for the output. This reads a bit better, doesn't it? Not a whole lot, but a little bit better. So now let's refer to the sheet sheet again, because we do need to convert from whatever came out of this back into video. Oh, hang on, hang on. Check this out in my sheet sheet. I was smart a long time ago and I had an example of how to do multiple inputs right here in front of me this whole time. And it isn't a simpler example. Huh, cool stuff. We are going to continue with what we started, but good to know that this is here. And then to convert from raw video back into video, I will use this, the input file is this. It's interesting because on this conversion, the input file is called output, but never mind that. And the output is going to be an MP4. And this size needs to match the size of the input. See the dictionary coming up again? I need to turn this off. Yeah, I just need the size, which is this, and the frame rate, which is five. And specifically, I don't want this because I don't want it to be raw video, and I don't want that. I want to use the default pixel format for MP4s, which I think is YUV 420p. Anyhow, this should do the trick. Oh, hang on. These parameters are wrong. These parameters should be this.
No, that does not look right. What I really need is the command I ran to convert the thing to begin with. That. I have the pixel format twice. Okay, I think we have it. Moment of truth. No such file or directory. Why do you think that the file is sidechain.flag? Because I told you that? No, I didn't. Okay, no errors. Let's watch the result. An error occurred while loading the video file? Interesting. I think it may have to do with the pixel format. Let's check the pixel format of examples output.mp4 real quick. Oh, it has no duration? What the hell happened to this file? Output.mp4 is only 262 bytes? That doesn't look like a 10 second video file. What is the size of output raw? Zero bytes. Yeah, that's the, that's the problem, isn't it? Let's do this step by step. When I do this, what happens? An error. Okay. The following filters could not choose their formats. Consider inserting a format filter near their input or output. Error reinitializing filters. Maybe it is because this string of filter complex does not work when you are when you have these kinds of inputs. Maybe the flag file that is the example here has a different structure to it. So how about we try the the filter complex from the past. And importantly, this is the filter a mix. But I don't remember seeing a mix here. So what's up with that? Oh, it, it it doesn't say that it is multiple audio inputs. That's why it's not there. Interesting. It says that it is like N, which I think stands for like nothing. I don't I'm not even sure I understand that. Okay. But this should give us something. It's spending a bit more time on it, which is good news. All right. There you go. That's what we are all here for. <laughs> oh, in the and then it picks up. <laughs> <laughs> what the hell was that? I think I actually know. I think I actually know. I think that this may actually make sense. If you think about it, the, the two different files, the raw files, were created with different pixel formats. And the pixel formats represent pixels with different number of bits. So if one uses more bits than the other, then you may run out of data. That's a bummer. Does it mean that we need to use the same pixel format for both? Or that we need to classify all the pixel formats with the number of bits that they use? So that we only have matching filter? <laughs> or do we have to like slice the videos so that they have not the same duration, but the same number of bytes, so that the raw files have the same size. 
that is bananas. That is the kind of problem that I don't want to solve. We are probably just gonna stick with having the same pixel formats. <laughs> again, again. What, you want another data band? Or maybe we could look at this because the duration is the first and I bet that the first file is longer. I am right. So if I do like duration two, I suppose that this is gonna be the duration of the second one, which is gonna be shorter, but it's going to be bent all the way through. No, I am wrong. It is bent in the beginning and then it gets normal again. Bananas. Mix three audio streams, inputs three, duration first, dropout transition. Okay. Interesting. The number of inputs. Okay, so let's start dissecting this filter complex string. First, the name of the filter. That's this name here. Then an equals sign and a list of parameters for that filter. The number of inputs defaults to two. Could we have more cuts and try and mix all of them together? Yes, we could. Will we? Not right now. So the number of inputs is two and that's the default. So I can get rid of that. And then the column was separating multiple parameters. Then how to determine the end of string, the longest, the shortest, or the first. So the number two here is not even a valid option. And weirdly enough, it did not give me an error. I don't think, maybe it did. Yeah, nothing looks like an error here. Anyhow, we can just set the duration to the shortest. That will help us a little. Then drop out transition. Oh, it does volume renormalization, what the hell? Specify weight of each input audio stream as a sequence of numbers. Interesting, but let's not use it. And then normalize. Always scale inputs instead of doing summation of samples. Beware of heavy clipping in if inputs are not normalized prior or after filtering by this filter if this option is disabled. By default, it is enabled. I will use the default. And in fact, even if I disable this and we got some clipping, what's the worst that can happen? The video will be even crazier? That's good news, actually. So it seems like the duration is the only one that we actually want to set. Because by default it, will, default, it will be the longest. So with this, we should get a video that is about four seconds long and that is bent all the way through. Fun stuff. Those are the foundations for what I wanted to do with longer files. Let us, this line is an uninteresting because it is just converting from raw into MP4 and we know how to do that. But this line is interesting, even though it is kind of something that was already on the readme this whole time, but I am. Just learning about this now. <laughs> and I would argue that this this second thing subsumes the first because we are doing the mixing with smarter parameters and yeah, let's just get rid of this other example. So this whole time we have been working on just, I guess, remembering what we already knew, but that's all right. <laughs> that's part of the business. The last piece of the puzzle before we can put everything together is we need to be aware that we are in this state to begin with. 
So uh, the first thing we do when in the data vendor is query what is Why the hell is this called long small? It makes no sense. Was there a long big? I forget, but whatever. And is it going to be smart enough to realize that I renamed a binary file? Yes, it seems to be smart enough. If it wasn't smart enough, it would probably hang a little bit. Anyway, anyway. Um, yeah, so the first thing we do in the program is to query the file to see what's in there. How many streams of video are there? And what is the codec used by the video and all of that? And this is necessary for us to do the conversions back and forth. But, and, and this is the line, by the way, that we look for. So we will see a regular expression that starts like this with stream space. And then we gather the codec, the pixel format, the size, the bit rate, which is 693 in this case, the frame rate, all of that. We get all of this here. But now we need to go one level up. Remember, a file like an MP4 is a container that may contain multiple streams of media, multiple video files, or sorry, multiple video streams, perhaps multiple cameras, let's say. And then when playing the MP4, you could switch between cameras. That could be kind of cool, like if you are watching a game or something. Then multiple streams of audio, perhaps you have you have a movie and then you have audio in multiple languages. All of these are streams in the container, but the duration of the streams need to match. It doesn't make sense to have a container with five seconds of video and 10 seconds of audio. How are you gonna play that? I guess you could argue that the screen just goes black yeah, but don't don't think that way. It makes no sense, as I was saying. So we need to go and level up and look at the duration of the stuff in the container itself, which is another line here. So that's something that we need to do. We need to get this duration. Luckily, it is very easy to get this from the output. So because it happens above, I will have this line above. And I will call this if this is the input metadata match, I guess I will call this the duration match. Match in the sense that it is not math, but match in the sense that it is matching with a regular expression. So I'm going to get the input metadata text, which is this long string, and I'm going to match using a regular expression. The regular expression needs to treat each line separately. Uh, so when uh, by separately, I mean, when I say, for instance, dollar sign in a regular expression, the dollar sign means end of string. But if I put the M modifier here, it means end of line, whatever. It's just the way that I conceptualize this. So we are going to see an end of line, we are going to see one or more spaces because this is indented. So space, not one or more, zero or more. You can see that this is the same as the other one. Then we will see duration, column, space. And then we will see two numbers. Backslash D means digit so it's like zero to nine we will see two numbers and this parenthesis mean i am interested in this part of the match it's a capture group not only that i am interested in that and i am naming this that's what the question mark and the angle brackets mean i am naming this part of the match the hours then column then minutes, then seconds, then frames. Well, actually not frames, because my file 
is not 40 frames per second. So this must be milliseconds. But it cannot be milliseconds because it's not three numbers. You know what we are going to do? We are going to ignore this part because I don't know what to do with it. That's the end of the regular expression. We are going to get the hours, the minutes, and the seconds. It should be more than good enough. Then we will need to query is the duration match null or is <coughs> the duration match groups undefined? Same as here, right? If so, throw new error. Fail to find duration. Then we need to compute the duration based on this. So we take the duration match groups hours. What is the type of this? Oh, it's just a record. So I'll take the hours and it's, it is going to be a string. So I'm going to convert this into a number. Is this how you do this? Yes. And I'm going to do the same for the minutes and seconds. And then I am going to define the duration in seconds. Yeah, right. I'm going to define the duration in seconds. So it means that I want to multiply this, the minutes by 60, and I want to multiply the hours by 60 by 60. And then I want to add everything up. Now I have the duration. Is it right? Let's see. I'm going to log the duration and npm start. This is going to run the thing with the short file. Let's not look at the results yet. Or maybe the results already popped up, but I didn't look at them. The video short is 10 seconds long. I expect to see the number 7 in the console. And I do. That's all right. So now we have the duration. Let's find the place where we start bending stuff. So these are for us to explore pixel formats, audio formats, and filters. These are like scaffolding. They are like test stuff. So this is the place where we actually do the bending. And to do the bending, we have this data band function. I am thinking that maybe we will want to dive into the data band function itself and implement this there. This may be the right place to do this. Yeah, right. Where is input raw coming from? Ooh, right, yeah. So I was making the assumption that there would be only one input raw and now there are two input raw files. Or there may be two input raw files. So let's define a, an auxiliary variable here for us to have a single place where we um, where where we communicate what we call a long video that needs to be split and mixed in this different way. If the duration is greater than ten seconds, it is a long video. So now we can start. to use this long variable and not sure I love this so if it is long well not even that I would just define the name whatever yeah 
Okay, I think I'm gonna rename this. I'm gonna say that this, uh, no, I'm gonna say input long. Is this good? It is not. We'll deal with this later. In the data band function, this is us converting a file from MP4 into raw. If it is a long file, else that. So now we're going to have a special rule for when it is a long file. And the special rule will be that we will be doing the slicing just like this. So these are the only arguments we need. Everything else is taken care of on this line. So before we specify the input, we need to specify this. And we will need to convert from seconds into the timestamp situation in multiple places. Let's see if FFmpeg is happy to take the number of seconds, because that would be a hell of a convenient thing for it to do. Now, on the command line, when we asked for help, we saw just time off. <laughs> That's all we had. Didn't even specify the format. But here, it will say what the position is. Let's see. When used as an input option before I, that's the case, six in this input to position, correct. Now, what is the different ways we can specify the position? Note that in most formats, it is not possible to seek exactly. Yeah, that's true. Uh, so FFmpeg will seek to the closest seek point before position. When transcoding and accurate seek is enabled, the default, and we are transcoding. We are transcoding from something like an MP4 will have an X, uh, an H264 encoded stream, and we are converting that into raw. So we are transcoding. And accurate seek is enabled by default. So we don't have to worry about this. This extra argument between the seek point and position will be decoded and discarded. When doing stream copy or no accurate seek is used, it will be preserved. Okay, none of this that concerns us. When used as an output option, decodes but discards input until the timestamp, whatever. Position must be a time duration specific. See that. That's what I want. Time duration. There are two accepted syntaxes for expressing duration. And it seems as though the number of seconds is one of them. Excellent. S expresses the number of seconds with an option decimal part M. Oh, so yeah, M here was expressing decimal values. It was not expressing frames. Anyway, seconds expresses the number of seconds with the optional part M, the optional uh, literal suffixes s m s or u s which probably stands for microseconds indicate to interpret the value of seconds milliseconds or microseconds okay in both expressions the optional minus indicates negative duration no kidding all right so we don't have to convert from seconds into this shenanigans we can just say the number of seconds here and we need to convert that into a string And then here is the duration of the new file. And that can be just the number 10. Uh, in our examples, it was the number 10. I think it would be nice to allow the person to perhaps select this length. No, you know what? Never mind that, because the different pixel formats are going to mess with the length anyway, so you have no guarantee that you will have 10 seconds of output. We had three seconds of output in our other examples, so yeah. 
10 seconds is good enough. Let's leave it at that. Now for the seek point, we have to go to a random place in the duration minus 10 seconds, because we want the length to be 10 seconds. So we need to seek to a place that is going to allow 10 seconds of video to even be available to begin with. But we want this to be a random number. So let's take math.random times this. And this is going to give us a fractional number, but we want a whole number of seconds, don't we? No, we do not. We do not want that because we can have a fraction here. Yep, that seems legit to me. So this is going to create the input raw file and then we rinse and repeat for the input raw, what is it called? Input long raw? Yeah, input long raw raw. Raw, 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 raw. Uh, yeah, I think that this is gonna produce two input files for us. And then the next FFmpeg invocation is to do the filtering. But what I'm realizing now is that this is also specific to whether it's long or not. So I'm going to do it like this. I used some clever braces here to put this expression in here. So now if we are doing long, we will do the conversions and the filtering in a special way. And for that, we need the reference from here. So we will replace this audio filter stuff with filter complex. And we will have two input files. This is one. Ah, the dictionary is coming up. And this is the other. And then at the end of everything, when all the deed is done, we want to remove the input long raw as well. I think that does it. Let's see. Hey John, I was just talking about you because I was watching your stream right right after I right before I started mine. <laughs> and I usually look in my timeline on YouTube to see if someone uh, the subscriptions page to see if someone else is streaming at the same time, especially now that I don't have really a regular schedule so to speak. I will get back to having a regular schedule, but I don't have one right now. <laughs> so I I, I I hope that you you and I streamed at the same time for only a little while. <laughs> I hope that it wasn't a, a big issue. <laughs> Lady got raw, yeah. <laughs> and yes, we'll deal with this later. <laughs> Is the nature of the game. All right, so this, uh, when, when I ran NPM Starch, it was using the short example. So that's not gonna help us because we are trying to test the long example. Let's commit what we have and then change the test to use the long file. Let's just review real quick what we wrote today. Yep, all of this checks out. And let's go to package JSON and change start to use long. So what would we expect to see as this is running here on the outputs? Oh, hang on, there is something else. No, there isn't, Never mind. I'm not even gonna explain my thought because it was silly. So as this is running, we expect to see two files and we, we see two files, 
and files are coming out of this. That's great news. <laughs> First try, everyone. Hey. And we have cool, crazy results. We do. That is exactly what happened. When we were experimenting with this by hand, we were experimenting with data banding. We have this shot in which I was playing the ukulele and then I switched hands and it continued playing the ukulele. And when we mixed the two together, they would superimpose like that. And that is super cool, if you ask me. I love this. <laughs> and the coolest thing when we were experimenting was exactly this. I was going to say that this happened and it happened. So what happened when we were experimenting with this was at some point the two heads were bobbing and then they synced like this. Amazing stuff. I love it. And you may have noticed that both examples have 10 seconds exactly. And that's because we have to sprinkle a bunch of to-dos on here. We have to sprinkle a bunch of to-dos. Use different pixel formats and so forth. When you have long videos, you have no reason to use the same pixel format for both. And the other to-do I'm going to put here more filters because right now we have only the mixing filter and I will have one more to do that I'm also going to leave here which is to bend the raw inputs and we can bend the raw inputs differently and then merge them with another effect like sidechain compression if that's not crazy enough for you I don't know what is crazy enough for you I think you are crazy Let's watch all of them. <laughs> Ooh, I like this one. It is like, well, first of all, the cut is really good because it is sinking and getting out of sync in a nice way. But also this whole blue and purple stuff reminds me of some like old sci-fi movies like Gataka. You know this one from, I guess, the 90s? I never watched it entirely, to be honest, but it is that that that's what this blue and purple thing reminds me of. Ooh, this one is also nice, blue and red. And what's up with these stripes? It seems like most of them are have these vertical stripes. That's kind of weird. Oh, this one doesn't. This one is is crazy. And the craziest thing that we are is that all we are doing is mixing. So essentially we are just adding up two files right, or two sections of the file. So we are only adding, we are not doing anything interesting. So the only interesting thing we are doing to have all of these weird results is just playing with the pixel format and the audio format. And we are even being consistent. Both input files have the same format, same variable, see? Isn't that crazy? Yeah, so it must start repeating at some point. So this blue and red is kind of similar to six. And this is also similar to some of these or one of these. This is nice. <laughs> All righty. I will commit this to do's and my change the package JSON to use the long file. I have a coding challenge challenge if you are interested. I am interested. What is the coding challenge? Tell me about it. There are always two way two of them. The idea alone is crazy enough. <laughs> yeah, there are always two of them. Two Leandros, I suppose. <laughs> All right, yeah. 
I think that that, ra that wraps it up. With data bench, long files, I'm happy. So, the DVD screensaver animation, but it's my logo or any image. Oh, interesting. So you're saying, are you saying that we should do the ba a data bench that does that kind of, pew, 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 or are you thinking of like a video processor in Reaper or what is exactly the idea? It is cool to implement this though. It's not too difficult either to do the DVD and logo animation. Just have to know the bounds of the frame and anytime and you set, you set the thing to start in a random direction and anytime that it reaches the boundary, you flip the sign of the vector. So if it is going up and for your coordinate system up is positive, when it reaches the top, you make that vector negative and then it starts going up. So it's super, super simple to implement and perhaps that's why the DVD screensaver was that. I want to have it for, uh, to be right back screen could be in Reaper video processor. Yeah, if you want to do that in the Reaper video processor. <sighs> John, I think I'm gonna bite the bullet. <laughs> It's a Friday night, let's write some code. Yeah, let's do a video processor that does that for you. Because it it shouldn't take too long, should it? I don't think it should take too long. It's gonna be in EEL, and I'm gonna call this DVD, and I'm gonna put the EEL extension, or maybe JS effects. I think, uh, try to remember what the EEL extension for Visual Studio Code is bound to, and it seems to be bound to .eel. Good, good, good to go. Uh, I think it can be done. Just reverse the speed of X and Y position if it hits the edge. Yeah, that's exactly what I was thinking about. The only thing I'm now second guessing myself is we need to keep the speed in the X and Y axis. We need to keep the speed across frames, that's the whole point. And we need to keep the position uh, where we are bleeding the thing across frames. And I know that it is possible to keep information across frames. I just don't remember how to do that. Well, we'll get to it when we get to it. First, we need to open Reaper. And if I do, is my audio going to be messed up? I don't think so, but it may, we'll see. Is my audio still okay? It seems to be, the C-meter is moving. All right, so let's have a MIDI item. Let's add a video processor to it. And, or maybe not a, a MIDI item like that. Let's have an image for real, so. The image is going to be the image is going to be this. Perfect. And I will put this under code data bender. Um, source, DVD, oh, it went away, right as I was gonna get it. Not sure what's in my downloads folder, it may be embarrassing, so I will switch this for a moment. All right, we have a file there, that's the file. Let's drop this here, and and a video processor to that. I suppose that you will want this to be an overlay. And it makes more sense that way because you do have the flexibility of having a black screen if you want, or you may want to have your face or whatever. So I'm gonna make this as an overlay. So let's start by having an overlay. 
image overlay just like that and then let's open the video preview and we can move it around good we can zoom out and start moving it around so the our job now is to change the x and y offset in a way that is going to bounce around randomly maybe not even randomly it doesn't have to be random It just needs to be arbitrary. It doesn't have to be random. So the way I like to start is with a preset because it usually gives me a good enough starting point, especially when I'm doing something like an overlay and I don't have to remember to set these shenanigans that sometimes are necessary. But I do not like the style in which these things are written. Short names and weird long lines and the spacing is a bit weird so the first thing i do is i first i find something that is similar to what i want to do the second thing is i clean it up so it is in my style so to speak i would just quickly see if you are like adding more information to the challenge in a way that is going to change what i need to write i think it can be done just refers the speed but it should move continuously diagonally by 10 pixels Fair enough. And Beats Bestel, I still don't know how to pronounce this username, but hey, what is up? Great to see you here. So what's going on is first, in the beginning of the stream, one hour, whatever, how, however long ago, one hour and 15 minutes ago, that was how long ago it was. I started by talking about something that has nothing to do with code, has to do with abusive relationships. If you're interested in knowing more about it, you can watch after the stream is over and rewind. Second, we worked on some data banding stuff. So we wrote code to do, to go from this kind of video, me playing the ukulele, very happy. And we turned that into this kind of video. And now I was about to say goodbye, but uh, John proposed the challenge and I thought it would be interesting to implement it. So we are doing the DVD logo stuff, bouncing around in a video processor in Reaper. Yeah, that, that, that is cool. I find data bending very cool. Anyway, it starts at X1, Y1 and moves right and down by 10 pixels. Okay. So you want the thing to be deterministic. It is arbitrary, but it's not random. Yeah, I think that is the way to go. So let's clean this up. Do we want opacity? No. Do we want to zoom? Perhaps you would want to have the picture bigger or smaller. Is the DVD logo, I don't remember that, but is the DVD logo like just touching the sides or does it eat a little bit of the sides first. I don't remember that. Anyway, uh, I think I may not give you the option to zoom right off the bat. And the X and Y position are going to be controlled programmatically, so we don't need that. And in terms of filters and alpha channels, uh, no, none of that. So image one, let's rename that to image one. <laughs> and image two, is that uh, I, I didn't do it right but the thing is image one and two have meaning one is the background and one is the overlay so which is which which is bleated first image one is bleated first and image two is bleated second so this is the overlay and this is the background and these are spaces, I like them. And the reason why I started with the Reaper stock image overlay preset, the reason why I started with that is because you have this crazy stuff like the background is input track zero and the overlay is just zero. Who has time to remember and, 
and know all of this. So this use, I think it's Sirs Alpha. And the overlay is not the background color space RGBA. I use the color space RGBA because sometimes things don't work if you don't. So I'm just going to set this. And then the input info. So we have the background image width. And the background height. Isn't this much better? I think it is. And then the project width and height valid. I don't remember what this is, but it seems to be a stock variable. Let's look at the docs real quick. Do you want to install the recommended extensions for Python? Why do you think that this is Python? Okay, so I think... I think I'm not going to set any of these. Why, why would I care for setting the project width on this video processor? And are these going to come up elsewhere in the code? No, so I can remove all this. And then the opacity, it is clipping the opacity, why? I don't even have opacity anymore. You, if you want to have a translucent, is that the word? A translucent DVD logo, then perhaps have a translucent PNG to begin with. I'll go with that. Because I, I set the color space to RGBA, I think uh, a transparent or translucent PNG will just work. Okay, so if the overlay is not the same as the background, and the input info, and then we have this stuff, and these are used. And I think I will need that, because I need to know the size of the thing I'm working with to be able to tell that it bounced on one of the edges of the project. So I think that this input info I will need to keep. But I, of course, am going to give it a bit more space and rename this variable into overlay width. Isn't this much better? Is it just me? Overlay height. Okay, and then if the overlay is the same as the background, why would you bother putting this preset or putting this video processor in the item to begin with? I can remove this if. So then first we bleach the background and this zero here is preserving the aspect ratio, if I remember correctly. And in fact, I'm going to bleed this first because the story will go like this. First set this, it is kind of a requirement for transparent things to work. Then these things are just getting inputs. Fine. Then bleach the background. Then start doing stuff for the overlay. So that's why it is in this order. And if your alpha is greater than zero, then can remove this if because we don't have alpha do a translucent png then setting this unnecessary and that was the alpha that's unnecessary the mode i'm not going to use different modes the zoom if you want something that is zoomed out make a smaller png so no zoom then dw and dh these are going to be coordinates. And in the preset that we started with, the coordinates had a whole system where zero maps to the left and one maps to the right, I think. No, minus one maps to the left and one maps to the right and zero maps to the middle. We're not gonna use this coordinate system. So I can get rid of all these lines. Just split the overlay, keep the aspect ratio. And these are the dimensions. And this is the coordinate. So let's try and put this at 100, 100, just to see if we have something on the page, to see if I didn't break the overlay video processor in the process of changing it. OK. It is bleeding something. And maybe I should have another image as the background, just to see if I'm not messing with that. So let's take a screenshot. And 
come here and do that and then do this and it didn't work and then try again and now it worked and then stretch it out perfect so my head is an overlay on top of the background that's perfect now we need to make this bounce around and for that we need to keep the x and y coordinates from the previous frame how does one do that i think maybe one does that by using global variables i want to say let's put another video processor in here and play around with the presets and try to find the solution for this problem and alternatively if you're watching this and you already know the answer please let me know john i know you are a specialist in video processors so maybe oh you sent me an image on discord i think i think that my my image is fine <laughs> yeah I think it's just touching okay so just touching which means we do the easy thing okay I started data benching with Windows 98 involuntarily <laughs> I remember watching this video by um, Electro Boom and he was doing something I forget exactly what and then he burned a wire and he was like I invented the light bulb inventing the light bulb is not that difficult same with data benching. <laughs> data benching is not that difficult. Well, I guess it is because you don't want to corrupt the file. I just try it like this. If image exceeds X on the uh, left or the right, multiply X by minus one and then the same for Y with height. Exactly, that's the plan I have. The only problem I have is, and I, you're considering that X and Y are speeds, exactly, the vec, the, the what I would call the velocity vector. Anyway, the, my problem is, I need to keep a cross frame. So remember, my video processor is running this code on every frame. And I need some information to stick around for the next frame because I need to know where I was in the previous frame to update that position. I'm sure there is a way to do this. I just don't remember how it goes. One thing we could do is we could look at the time in the project. That's something we could do because the time in the project is advancing. But the problem is we would need to recompute from scratch based on the time, the position that we want to be at. And that sounds like no way to live your life. It is much better if we can just find a way to preserve information across frames. So let's see if there is something that might give us an answer. Let's look at the presets that come with Reaper. Color picker, histogram. A histogram is something that is probably going to take the histogram off the frame, so it doesn't keep information across frames. Apply track effects only where track video. No, that doesn't do it. This is also something that can occur in a single frame. To deinterlace, you do need to keep the previous frame because interlacing is this idea where you have a bunch of lines that make up a frame and you on each frame, you only send the odd lines or the even lines, and to deinterlace is to combine the two frames together again. So it needs to keep one frame across frames. But it's probably going to do that with auxiliary images, which is not what I want. I want just a plain variable. So this image, the frame rate, that may be interesting because to decimate the frame rate is to take like 25 frames per second and freeze some of these frames in a way that is going to seem like it's five frames per second. So you're just discarding four frames and then showing one, discarding four frames and showing one. And when I say discarding four frames, I mean just use the previous frame again. But it is using auxiliary images. So that doesn't help us. Let's go to the next one. Uh, fading an item effects video, that does not help because we're fading it is also an instantaneous thing. It doesn't need to remember stuff from the past. Resize, no. Track opacity, that is all stateless. Uh, stateless, stateless. Crossfade is stateless. Grid of videos is stateless. 
bleeder feedback. I don't know what that is, but a feedback suggests that there is some remembering going on. Oh well, there doesn't seem to be. Gaussian blur is stateless. That's stateless, stateless, stateless. Matrix of recent frames can use auxiliary images. That's stateless, that's probably stateless. Also stateless. Show motion, subtract last frame. I bet that that's going to use auxiliary images, and it is using stage lighting. I think that this one may be the answer. Yes, this time stuff. Time is using speed, and speed is one of the parameters. But check this out. Oh, no, it's using the time. Time is a special variable, isn't it? Yes, item time in seconds, if in item. So this is using that approach I was mentioning, where it looks at the time in the Reaper timeline. So this is deterministic, but it is based on the time, and that's bad, because if we base our thing on the time, then we would need to sort of retrace all our steps every frame. And that's no fun. On the staging lighting preset, that's kind of okay to compute a color based on that. You're just taking a cosine. But in our case, it's not that simple. So let's continue. Text time code is stateless. This is stateless. This is stateless. I think this, these two also seem stateless to me. Horizontal wipe. How does that work? Hmm. Matrix wipe. Oh, that's definitely stateless. Oh, we have a screensaver. Move, blanks screen after no change. Huh, interesting. But that is using an auxiliary image to keep information across frames. So I couldn't find a preset that would give me the answer. How do you keep state across frames in a video processor? I don't know, but here is a, a guess. Let's see if we are lucky. Perhaps in the video processor, Reaper is gonna do the same that it does in JS effects, where it keeps the variables values across samples in the case of JS effects. So if this is the case, then we could do something like this. X plus equals to one. And Y plus equals to one. And this is X and Y. Now, if my theory is correct, then the first time we get here, x is zero, so we go to one. And the next time we go around, x is one, so we go to two and three and so, and so on. So if this is the case, which I'm not too confident about, we will see my face going to the bottom right. If I am wrong, it's going to be stuck at the top left. Oh, there you go. I am right. And to keep state across frames, all you have to do is just use variables. <laughs> that was a long detour to find a silly thing. Anyway, now what we want is given the project width. So John wanted to go 10 pixels on every frame, right? We want to be a bit faster. And And this X and Y here are the coordinates. But we also need to be aware of the speeds. 
So I am going to use a short variable name. I know, I know. I am going to use a short variable name, but only because this is kind of a name that is well established in physics, the x and the y, and these are the deltas of x and y. Or you know what? No, I'm gonna be more explicit. So x and y, I'm okay with having a single letter as a variable name, because those are well known. But dx and dy may not be as well known. So I'm going to say speed, or maybe velocity on the x-axis, and velocity on the y-axis. And then plus equals velocity, right? Do you remember physics, how position is changing over time with respect to velocity? That's what I'm doing here. So velocity is 10. And the trick is that Oh, that's actually to set the velocity I need to know if I bounced and I, I'm coming back right I need to know if this 10 is 10 or minus 10 if it is going down or going up so in a way I want the velocity to also have to keep track of stage so I'm going to hack something here the velocity is never gonna be zero we never want the thing to be stuck bouncing left and right or stuck bouncing up and down or even worse just stuck not moving so if the velocity is zero, it means that we just started. This is the first frame. So I'm gonna say 10. Or maybe I'm gonna say something like seven. So it is not just bouncing on a diagonal. So to begin with, this is seven, or maybe even a random value. It's gonna be seven. Um, Alternatively, if on the x-axis you are bouncing on the left or the right, I want to flip the polarity. So now we need to check if my x is less than zero or if my x is greater than the project width minus the overlay width, which means I bounce on the right. If that's the case, then the velocity is flipped, like so. Otherwise, just keep the velocity as it is. And then bada bing, bada boom. And I'm going to change this 7 to a 13. So it's going to be kind of arbitrary. Oh, and I'm also going to change this axis and this W's. And I think we did it. Let's see. I think we did it, but my overlay is too big. Is that what this is? Let's set a, a project. Uh, what is the keyboard shortcut for this? What is the keyboard shortcut for project settings? I forget. Project settings. Now I know. It is option enter. The video will have a preferred video size of uh, 2000 by 2000. Okay, now my overlay is smaller, so what happens then? Boop. Boop, boop. Cool stuff. How do I share this with John? Hey, John, freeze frame and copy the code. No, um, I'm gonna send this to you on Discord. I'm gonna put this on GitHub. GitHub, just DVD logo, EL, GIST description, oh, this, and youtube.com slash video, that should be the 
that should be the URL. Create public gist, 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 gif, gif. I don't know. I got it to move fine, but got lost on the conditions. I think we just need a loop, adding 10 to the positions and flip to minus 10 if the corners touch. Exactly. That's how I started anyway. It should be continuous plus 10 or minus 10. Well, now it is plus or minus 7 and 13, but you know where to go and change. I hope you like this. It was a fun little challenge. All right. This has been a lovely Friday evening nerding out with you all. Thank you very much for coming. I hope to see you again next week. I don't know exactly on what day, so subscribe, smash the like button, do all the things, the, all the things, and you will know when I stream again. It will be early next week, I hope. Thank you, John. Beats Bastion, John, and different John. Bo, Mage, and Nod was one for joining me here. In the conversation uh, yeah all right you two have a great weekend enjoy see you next week thanks for being here and yeah haha <laughs> this is very low tech I don't even have my keyboard shortcut set up the, the right way all right bye thank you for watching the stream you know how great it has been or maybe it sucked and I am glad that you stuck with me And so we'll all will be Back together for some more Coding or talking or chilling The next time I'll be streaming